morning, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Um, I believe that the reference to my being a giant was my freak, freakish tallness, and uh, but it was a, a great thing to hear where all of you are from. I'm very impressed with the international uh, nature of the uh, student body. This is a very impressive worldwide um, effort. That's great. Um, I was asked to give, uh, as Dana said, an overview of the discipline of heliophysics or space physics, space plasma physics, solar and space physics, of so various names. Uh, heliophysics is what NASA calls this discipline. By nature, this will be uh, a rather personal view of uh, its of course, impossible in a, a period of an order, uh, one hour or so to talk about all the things that have gone on in uh, space physics. But um, I hope that this will be a sampling, and I hope you'll use this um, school, this summer period, to identify things and to um, look at things that really interest you that will really inspire you to go on and, and dig in greater depth into many of these areas. Uh, I have the the comfort of knowing that there are going to be many excellent lecturers following me who are going to go into greater depth on virtually all of these topics. So let's, uh, let's get started here. And um, if you have questions of clarification or so during the lecture, please uh, ask me. Um, and I hope there will be uh, plenty of time for questions at the end as well. The things you see here on the cover, by the way, are just two nice pictures. The one on the left is the, the sun, uh, seen in um, extreme ultraviolet and uh, showing active regions. The image on the right is from the image spacecraft, showing a powerful geomagnetic storm and the aurora associated with that. I hope during the course of this you'll get a, an understanding of these two bookends in the heliophysics system. To me, at least, the, the discipline of space physics what we now call heliophysics, really got started um, on the night of the 31st of January, 1958. Uh, the three people pictured here are Werner von Braun, a uh, German-American scientist and engineer who um, really brought the capability uh, to the United States of launching um, large payloads into space, rocketry. The person on the left is William Pickering, who was the uh, then the director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Caltech, um, uh, the NASA center that now is responsible for carrying out planetary and um, solar system exploration. And the person in the center here, who's maybe having a little trouble reaching the Explorer th uh, 1 spacecraft model that's being held aloft is uh, James Van Allen. And um, he was, began to be my mentor uh, when I was an undergraduate student. and. Um, the reason that I point to this night as being the beginning of space physics as we know it is because uh, these three guys worked together to launch this small object um, or its counterpart into space and they made the first important discovery of the space age which was that the earth is surrounded by belts of very high energy radiation and uh, Professor Van Allen went on to be recognized. Uh, the Van Allen belts around the uh, Earth now have his name. Uh, Professor Van Allen was a very modest person. Um, when asked by a reporter in my presence um, what the Van Allen belts are good for, he said they hold up Van Allen's pants. And uh, uh, this was a, a nice, uh, cute answer, but um, he, re he really was a person who led by example. And uh, their work, the work of these guys really can be pointed to. Now you might say, well, what about going back to the studies of the sun, sunspots uh, by the uh, ancient Chinese? Yes. Um, what about Galileo 400 years ago pointing telescope at the sun and the planets? And Galileo first uh, recognizing and, and documenting sunspots? Yes. Um, what about uh, all the work of uh, studying the sun in the 1700s, the beginning to understand that there's a sunspot cycle. Yes, indeed. Um, the work on uh, studying cosmic rays um, prior to the work I'm pointing to here, yeah, indeed, again, that's true. But uh, as a discipline, as far as sending things into space, making in-situ measurements, we can point here. And I should say, 
You could also say, well, what about Sputnik a few months earlier than this? And indeed, <coughs> that's true. <coughs> but um, the first real um, detection and documentation <coughs> of, the, um, of the presence of uh, radiation in space really dates back to this. So as I say, <coughs> I'm going to give you a very personal kind of uh, view as we go through this. And so I'll talk a little bit more about these disciplinary roots. I'll uh, talk about what I call the decades of discovery, the 1960s and 70s. Um, and uh, I sort of come into the picture uh, sort of in the middle uh, of this or uh, in that uh, decade. And um, the decades of cooperation, which I think have been very important and very uh, key to this uh, worldwide success. And then building the, what I call the Great Observatory, or what now is called the Heliophysics System Observatory. And um, permeating all of this is also the uh, comparative planetology, not only studying the Earth but also and the Sun, but studying the relationship and the interrelationships with uh, other planetary systems. And then I'll conclude with a, um, a look more toward the future. So what did Van Allen and colleagues really discover? Um, as I alluded to, they discovered that the magnetic fields um, enveloping the Earth, emanating from the Earth's core and enveloping the Earth, really were populated by uh, very high energy particles confined by those magnetic fields, charged particles confined by those fields. And you're going to be studying a lot about this, the basic physics of all of this during this week, I know. Probably many of you know something about it already. But on the right here is the uh, population of very high energy protons, mostly high energy ions. And commingled with that is also a population or a set of populations, really, of high energy electrons that form a toroid. Both of these should be thought of as a cross section. These are really donuts surrounding the Earth. You can see the Earth here and a low Earth satellite. And so this. Uh, inner zone dominated by energy protons, a corresponding electron population, a region that's <clears throat> devoid of particles called the radiation belt slot region, and the outer belt, which is highly dynamic and is a fascinating uh, region to study from a physics standpoint. And uh, I will talk in several ways about that, and I know you'll hear a lot more about it as the uh, week goes on. If you really are interested, and I hope you are, about probing the origins of the discipline, uh, there's a relatively new book. Um, this is the cover from this, called Opening Space Research, and it talks about dreams, technology, and scientific discovery, written by George Ludwig. George Ludwig was an <clears throat> engineer and, uh, and scientist who worked with the Van Allen team. Here's Professor Van Allen again. Carl McElwain, who's Professor Emeritus at University of California, San Diego, the late Ernie Ray and George Ludwig. And this team was really the group that um, put together the first instrumentation that was launched on Explorer 1 and Explorer 3. This book talks about the origins of the Explorer mission, the US space program in the context of cosmic ray studies, which had been carried out by Van Allen's group um, looking, using balloons and, and small rockets. And uh, something that's very important, uh, this is more political, and I won't dwell on it a whole lot here other than to say that this, this book and that part of the history really makes clear the crucial importance of university research in the uh, fundamental uh, program of space re civilian space research, and for that matter, grew out of uh, military space research in the 1930s and 40s. And so, I urge you to go back and read this book and get some feeling for how space physics got started as a spacefaring discipline and uh, to understand some of these uh, origins and interrelationships. Just briefly, I would go on to say that, that the 1960s was a spe uh, spectacular time scientifically. Um, the United States and, uh, the Ru and Russia, the Soviet Union, and, uh, and beginning of other countries having the capability of launching things into space. And uh, the United States in particular was, um, was just um, alive with the opportunity to launch missions uh, every place and look. And I guess they listened to Yogi Berra, the famous philosopher and baseball player, who said you can observe a lot just by looking. And uh, that was really one of the goals of uh, of the scientific and engineering community was to send things everywhere, see what was going on, and put together a picture of, 
um, what was happening around the Earth, what was happening in interplanetary space, what was the real nature of the sun seen from that vantage point. And so uh, these Pioneer series of spacecraft were uh, launched hither and yon. They made measurements of magnetic fields, of uh, plasmas, energetic particles, made measurements of cosmic rays uh, to great altitudes, and studied the um, origins of energetic particles from the sun. A fantastic period of time with small spacecraft devoted to this exploration. The 1970s, as I say, uh, ushered in an amazing era of exploration, going from just um, simple looks to much more coordinated and orchestrated looks at um, our neighbors in space. As I say, um, <clears throat> I was, uh, I'd done uh, well, I guess, in uh, Professor Van Allen's modern physics course, and he asked me if I'd like to design, build, and test, and participate in a, a mission to go to Jupiter. And um, as an undergraduate, I found that to be a remarkable thing. I didn't know how remarkable. But um, it's influenced my life to this very day. And uh, my lab here in Colorado, uh, we now have 100 plus undergraduate students working in it. I, uh, I continue to believe that this is crucially important. But the Pioneer missions were designed to, uh, for the first time, to explore beyond uh, the uh, orbit of uh, Mars to go through the asteroid belt to go to uh, Jupiter and then to Saturn and beyond. Uh, the uh, launches took place flawlessly. Uh, this was an era when NASA decided that the best way was not to build the Battlestar Galactica, but was to build two relatively simple spacecraft and send them both and hope one got through. In fact, both Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11 got through. This little inset may be hard for you to see from the back, but it's really, uh, it shows the spectacular discoveries or some of the discoveries at Jupiter, seeing the most intense radiation environment one could har really imagine. Uh, huge fluxes of very, very high energy uh, particles confined in the magnetic fields of uh, Jupiter. Hence, these are called the Van Allen belts, Jupiter Van Allen belts or Jovian Van Allen belts, and appropriately so, but also showed that each of the Galilean moons had quite a dramatic effect on, on uh, absorbing and eliminating some of the particles that otherwise would be there. So this was a, a spectacular discovery, and it really showed um, how, uh, how powerful the Jupiter magnetosphere was compared even to the Earth's magnetosphere. And so the uh, observations from that time were this discovery of a huge volume around Jupiter. If you could see the uh, plasma extent of the Jovian magnetosphere, it would be the largest object in the sky by far, <clears throat> much larger than the sun. The in situ observations showed this powerful Jovian Van Allen belt. Um, this also showed the dominant role, uh, began to show the dominant role of the Galilean moons. We understand much more of, about that as a result of the next mission. But the next phase of my life was to go on to work with uh, Ed Stone at Caltech. And uh, uh, this was the era when um, and I'll talk about in a second about uh, the Voyager and what that went on to learn. But continuing this theme of, uh, of early 70s, mid-70s uh, discovery and exploration, NASA was not only sending things to the outer planets, but was also sending things uh, inward toward the sun and to the inner planets. And Mariner 10 was another spectacular success, flying uh, in uh, deeper toward the sun, flying by three times the planet Mercury, the sun's nearest neighbor, and they're, again, making a spectacular discovery that this small, rocky planet, Mercury, um, which rotated very, very slowly and hence might have been expected to be pretty dead, much like the moon, instead had a powerful intrinsic magnetic field and had its own magnetosphere that was an efficient and effective accelerator of energetic particles. So uh, in this small period of time, just a few years, we learned that Earth was not alone in having a magnetosphere that the giant planets, the outer planets, had magnetospheres, the inner planet Mercury had a magnetosphere, and all of these were places where powerful acceleration of particles and fascinating complex plasma interactions were taking place. Quite a remarkable uh, era indeed. So say um, the next uh, assault on this was a more systematic combination of planetary exploration and um, space physics observation and exploration, and this was the Voyagers. 
it was realized that there was a once in 250 year opportunity that all the planets would be aligned so that you could send one spacecraft to Jupiter, then to Saturn, then to Uranus, then to Neptune. This was called the Grand Tour. And that you had to launch at a particular time, and only that time uh, would humans have a chance, really, practically, to visit all these planets. And so Voyager 1 and 2 were launched. <clears throat> Voyager 2 was the spacecraft that was chosen to make the Grand Tour. And the uh, Voyagers did a spectacular job of returning information about the planets, the atmospheres of the planets, the, um, the moons surrounding them, discovering hundreds of moons and again um, confirming the presence of these powerful magnetospheric uh, volumes around the various planets. And Vo uh, Voyager launched in 77, uh, now continues to operate and play a crucial role, and they've moved now uh, billions of kilometers uh, from their starting point. They are out at the very fringes of the solar system. They're exploring, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but they're, uh, they've moved through one of the boundaries, one of the uh, key boundaries of our own solar system. Our solar system is like a magnetosphere on a grand scale in the whole scheme of the local interstellar medium. And so we're learning uh, even more of the sort of fractal nature of, of the systems going from the small to the um, incredibly large, and I'll talk about that. This uh, also began to usher in the period when uh, other nations, other uh, organizations uh, really wanted to work more cooperatively. The United States and uh, the European Space Agency uh, worked together on a mission called Solar Polar Mission. Uh, this was, the goal was uh, to understand more deeply the three-dimensional nature of our place in space. The, uh, all the missions I've talked about so far were basically confined to the ecliptic plane, the plane in which the planets appear to move. And uh, this is all sort of the low latitude regions of the sun and its uh, extension in space. The idea of the Ulysses mission was to use the gravitational boost from Jupiter to fly out to Jupiter, get a kick in a northward or southward way, I guess it was really southward, and to then fly to high um, heliospheric latitudes and to see what was the three-dimensional heliosphere, this region of influence of the sun, what was it really like in three dimensions. And um, I think it had to come as something of a surprise just how organized and how, um, how understandable but also maybe surprising this was. These are results from McComas et al showing results from the plasma and magnetometer instruments. I'll ask you first to focus just on the left side here, and it's a little complicated, but superimposed on this is a picture of the sun with these uh, uh, streamers out from the equatorial region of the sun. But what um, Ulysses found as it flew uh, over the poles of the sun was that uh, down in the region we live, it's a messy and there are highly fluctuating flows of plasma and the magnetic fields are very complex. But as you got to higher latitudes during this uh, solar activity minimum period, things started to straighten themselves out, and the sun was spewing out at high speed, about 700 kilometers a second, continuously and, and unidirectionally. Um, the flow of uh, plasma and magnetic fields, uh, I guess I'm really saying the magnetic fields were of one direction there over the poles of the sun, and that was true over the entire polar pass, and then getting back down into the low latitude messy region again, and then flying down to the south, seeing the magnetic fields there were pointed in the opposite uh, direction from the North Pole, and again, very high-speed flows. And so the sun on this uh, very huge scale was quite organized during the solar minimum time. The next pass was quite different when the sun was much more active, was spewing out things in all directions, and it was a much more disorganized picture over the entire volume of the sun. But this gave us uh, uh, tremendous new insights into the sun and its uh, behavior. Another uh, joint mission, and so remember this is the uh, decades of, uh, of cooperation, uh, a joint mission between Japan and the United States called YOKO, and this is the, what you would see if you had X-ray uh, detecting eyes and were in space. Uh, YOKO uh, operated for about one 11-year solar activity cycle. Uh, these pictures start in about 1990 or so and are uh, taken in soft x-rays and then progressively over the lifetime of Yoko. 
This is an iconic image uh, from uh, folks at Lockheed uh, Martin, but it shows that at the sunspot maximum, the sun is uh, very active over much of its surface, has these bright knots of uh, intense X-ray emission. As the sunspot numbers diminish, you start to see regions of uh, dark here, which are the coronal holes from which the high-speed solar wind I was telling you about emanates. As you go toward the sunspot minimum, the sun becomes very quiet and uh, uh, rather featureless. And then, uh, irresistibly, the sun moves back toward its uh, maximum and back to this active phase. And so um, the sunspot, the recognition that the sunspot goes through an 11-year cycle goes back to ground-based observations uh, literally hundreds of years earlier, but to see the full manifestation in space um, was a very important uh, thing and continues to be. Not only was it possible for nations to cooperate, but surprisingly enough, even agencies, different agencies of the U.S. government uh, learned for a while to cooperate. And uh, in the uh, early 90s, there was a mission joint between NASA and the United States Air Force that was called the Combined Release and Radiation Effects Satellite, CRESS. This was a mission that was uh, unfortunately very short-lived, uh, operated about 14 months, but it um, it opened uh, people's eyes in a spectacular way to the fact that the radiation belts, the Van Allen belts, were not just this quiet, quiescent, steady as a rock kind of a system, but rather they're capable of tremendous variation on incredibly short time scales. What's plotted over here, this is another sort of iconic image of our age, I guess, but uh, I'll ask you just to focus here. So what the vertical axis is, you can think of as radial distance measured in units of Earth radii from the surface of the Earth out to about here where uh, communication satellites, geostationary satellites operate. This is orbit number, which is another way of saying time, but on the 24th of March, 1991, the uh, greater than 13 MeV million electron volt electrons had been fairly benign and just sort of background. And within a period of a minute or two, the radiation belts changed completely. There was a uh, huge um, solar event that it we are inferring had caused a coronal mass ejection, which came out and struck the Earth's magnetosphere and suddenly changed the whole state of the system and produced population of 10, perhaps 20, 30 million electron volt, the kinds of things we see at Jupiter, but now we're seeing at Earth, and a new radiation belt was suddenly created. And this told us that the things we sort of thought we understood about the Van Allen belts really didn't, and we needed to go back and learn much more. And I'll talk more about that in a second. So the next phase of my life, this is sort of turning into a travel log for me, I guess, in a way. but. Um, I went from um, Los Alamos National Lab in New Mexico to uh, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center as lab uh, director, lab chief there. I was asked by the deputy center director, Frank McDonald, and the associate administrator of NASA at that time, Len Fisk, who's at the University of Michigan now, whether, what I thought of small um, PI, principal investigator-led satellite missions, and I said I thought they were a great thing. And they said, great, well, then you'll be the project scientist for a new program called the Small Explorer Program, SMEX. And this was a time then when the Explorer Program really got revitalized. Remember, Explorer 1, Explorer 3 were the first missions that were uh, used by Van Allen and coworkers to um, discover the Van Allen belts. There had been others that had been called Explorers in between. But this period in the late 1980s ushered in a new age of uh, dedicated development of small missions to study key specific themes and topics. And I, I hope you can see here, but there's just a hu huge array of missions in the SMEX line in the university class and missions of opportunity and the somewhat larger mi middle-sized explorers that commenced back then, supporting not only um, heliophysics but also uh, astronomy. Uh, but these missions, I think, have been a, spectac a spectacular success. Uh, I, would, um, I would suggest to you that this is easily the most successful line of missions ever for NASA. And uh, the things that they've studied, the aspects of our um, local environment as well as uh, remote astrophysical systems, is spectacular. And uh, missions uh, in, this, uh, in this series, uh, like COBE, 
have led to Nobel Prizes, and, and uh, it's quite a story in itself. Um, I'm particularly fond of the mission Solar Anomalous and Magnetospheric Particle Explorer. I was a lead investigator on this. Uh, Glenn Mason at the University of Maryland was uh, PI at that time. And as the complex title suggests, we call it SAMPEX, but it, it really was um, geared towards studying several different things to study solar energetic particles and their influence uh, in the Earth system. Um, also to study uh, what are called anomalous cosmic rays and the way that they get trapped in the Earth's magnetic field as well as studying the radiation belts themselves, uh, the magnetospheric part of this. And this mission even was uh, extremely important in improving our understanding of how the particles uh, leaking out of this magnetospheric volume down into the atmosphere influence the deeper layers of our neutral atmosphere. And uh, as I say, this mission has been extraordinary, uh, launched in 1992 and continues to operate uh, today. And I'll come back to that somewhat bittersweet story at the end. Um, about this same time, the mid-1990s, uh, led to another new and, um, and essentially um, transformative um, state of affairs. And this was the launch of the joint uh, ESA, European Space Agency, NASA, mission SOHO, the Solar Heliospheric Observatory. And this was really geared toward being a sentinel out at the first Lagrangian point, near the first Lagrangian point, being continuously out in space, being able to observe the sun continuously, to look at the sun in ultraviolet uh, X-ray wavelengths, to measure energetic particles, and in particular to have a coronagraph so one could look at the, the uh, blasts of material uh, that are superimposed here coming out from the sun. This mission um, from the get-go was crucially important for understanding what was going to really be coming at the Earth, and it uh, has continued to be a crucial mission. So the active sun um, in 2000, uh, the height of uh, the previous maximum solar cycle, uh, this is uh, for an event that was called the Bastille Day event. Uh, there uh, was an active region that led to uh, powerful emissions then. But I just think this is a beautiful picture of the, all of these knots of activity on the sun. The animation on the right is for about a, a period about three years later, um, in the late October, hence the Halloween storm period. And uh, come back here and we see in ultraviolet light the a bright flare. Um, this is an active region that flared. This also led to the release of a coronal mass ejection. The snow you see in the picture is from very energetic solar particles. Now you see this blast of material coming right at the Earth, probably at about 2,500 or maybe 3,000 kilometers per second. And the Earth was right in the uh, bullseye, right in the target zone for this uh, activity. So these, uh, not just one solar um, disturbance, transient disturbance, but many of them, and they hit the Earth in rapid sequence and caused a spectacular effect. So this is looking at the sun with a one space-based asset. And uh, so an artist's concept of what's going on here, and this is sort of prototypical of what we, we think of as the most uh, important solar disturbances. Uh, in case you don't recognize it, this is supposed to be the sun here. And what you'll see in a second is a region go unstable, blast out material moving outward at uh, these millions of miles per hour. Um, perhaps 10 to the 16th uh, grams, something like uh, 10 billion tons of material estimated to be in these, and then interacting with the Earth's magnetic field, the magnetic gates open, the, uh, part of the energy imparted to the system is huge, leading to powerful enhancement of aurora, and a whole host of things that we now call space weather. And I'll talk uh, briefly about a few of those things, and I'm sure you'll learn more about that during the course of this uh, next uh, week or so. But uh, that's what we believe uh, happened uh, essentially in the Halloween storms and in many, many other cases. Uh, but um, looking at the effects at Earth, this is the same format I was showing you before of uh, radial distance versus time. And this is from SAMPEX then from the time of its launch to uh, the uh, early 2004. Um, <clears throat> and you see, by the way, the beautiful, uh, this is 2 to 6 MeV electrons, and you see delineated what I was telling you about the Van Allen belts, the inner zone, sort of weak electron intensity, the slot region, and then this huge and highly variable uh, outer belt of extremely high energy electrons. The color coding here is, uh, is a logarithmic scale, several orders of magnitude from the blue to the red. So this is 
highly variable. Well, what I wanted to point to you here was a blow up from a, a Nature paper about this uh, back in 2004, looking at the 2003 event. There was a, for a period of time, there was a new belt of electrons created in the region, usually devoid of electrons. And then the inner belt got hugely enhanced after this. So the whole radiation belt region got reconfigured. We were fortunate as well to have another satellite looking from on high, far, from great distance, at this whole system. It was called IMAGE. And uh, not surprisingly, it imaged the various plasmas of the magnetosphere, um, as its name might imply. And one of the things that IMAGE was able to do was to look at the coldest plasmas, the very, very cold plasma coming emanating from the Earth's ionosphere. And because there's an admixture of helium plus, a singly charged helium in this, the uh, uh, image was able to use those wavelengths to look from on high and see the population of plasma that surrounds the Earth. And what we, uh, one of the essential things we saw during this uh, Halloween storm was that before the events hit the Earth, the plasma sphere was at its normal uh, state and extent, but afterwards, the uh, plasma sphere was essentially eroded away, completely changed in character, and only slowly recovered. And so one of the takeaway messages from the Halloween storms was that the coldest plasmas from uh, in the Earth's vicinity actually control the hottest plasmas, the highest energy particles, in an intimate way. And so there's not only a spatial coupling, but there's also an energy coupling between all the different parts of the system. And I hope you'll pay particular attention during this week to the lecturers who are talking to you about these different aspects and recognizing that the sun is tightly coupled to the earth and the earth in itself, the different regions of the atmosphere, the ionosphere, the, the magnetosphere are all closely coupled one with another and uh, they all uh, play back and forth on one another. So the early years, uh, pre-mid-90s, um, had the uh, exploratory qualities I was talking about. This is a timeline. I don't know how well you can see it. Maybe it's in your handouts uh, there, but you can see uh, SOHO here, another spacecraft polar, uh, the launch of a, another monitor of the uh, uh, Sentinel uh, looking at the solar wind ACE. Uh, all these missions then uh, leading up to the last sunspot maximum in 2000 when we had all the spectacular images I was telling about, the continuation of SAMPEX through this period of time. And then a, a new, uh, very intensive era uh, came about um, here in the mid-decade uh, of this past decade, this period when there was a, a whole flurry of activity. I just want to say a little bit about some of those missions, and again, sort of from a personal uh, point of view. But um, led by the uh, University of uh, California at Berkeley uh, was a spectacular mission called Themis, five spacecraft, really recognizing that there's a complex um, issue in solar and space physics, which is to try to separate spatial and temporal. If you have one spacecraft, you know a lot about the locale you're at, but you don't know whether how that's rather global, whether it's time variations or spatial variations that are causing things. And so the idea of Themis was to launch five identical spacecraft. Uh, this is a uh, numerical simulation of the magnetosphere. The sun is off uh, this way. This is the magnetotail region of the Earth, the night side region of the uh, Earth's uh, magnetic envelope. And the idea was to put these Themis spacecraft at various radial distances along here to answer some of the long-standing questions about what is it that leads ultimately to the intense brightening of the aurora? What is it that leads to something we call magnetospheric substorms? Where does it initiate? What is the nature of the dissipation that's associated with that? And uh, while I think we know a great deal um, to address that question, uh, there still is uh, quite a bit of question about how this works, and, and especially, as I'll come back to right at the end, how does this process of energy dissipation, magnetic reconnection, how does that really work at the microscopic level? And maybe some of you will go on to work on the next uh, missions in this uh, sequence that will, uh, I think, uh, ultimately answer that question. Another spectacular mission launched about the same time as the Themis 2004-2005 time frame uh, was uh, called, is called the Aronomy of Ice in the Mesosphere. Um, I'm particularly um, excited uh, that this mission has two instruments of the three 
that were built at my lab over in, uh, at LASP. And uh, we're doing the mission operations with strong student involvement over at LASP. And this mission is looking at the um, high altitude, what are called polar mesospheric or noctilucent clouds. And it's, it's looking at clouds that form at the coldest part of the Earth's uh, atmosphere, about 80 kilometers altitude in the summer uh, uh, hemisphere. And these clouds are a very, very sensitive indicator of uh, climate change. And so AIM has been making measurements now for uh, many years. Uh, it continues to make measurements despite challenges of, uh, of a faulty transceiver. Um, we just have had uh, contact after 177 days. We haven't lost, we've hardly lost a bit of data be because of the uh, genius of the operations team. But this mission um, is really one that, that is uh, tying together climate change, the uh, lower parts of the atmosphere, and the drivers from above. And, uh, and so this is another hallmark of our discipline these days is, is a more great uh, appreciation of the connectedness of all these systems. Yet another spectacular um, uh, achievement, I guess you could say, is that uh, we began to recognize that we can't just look at the sun from, from the uh, Earth-based perspective. We really have to take a more full 3D view of the sun. And so the launch of the dual um, stereo spacecraft, I believe in 2006 or so, um, the idea was to have uh, two satellites, one that would sort of lag a bit behind the Earth in its uh, one AU orbit, and one that would run a little bit ahead. And then to get views of the sun, not only from this perspective, but from the side views as well, and hence to get a stereoscopic view of the sun. Look what's really coming at us. So this was launched, and uh, the sun seems to be quite modest, because as soon as this was launched, the sun went into the most profound minimum of activity for two centuries, um, and has uh, and stayed in that state for several years. and so. Stereo was all geared up to look at these spectacular coronal mass ejections coming out, and the sun said, um, no thanks, I, I won't do anything for a while. It's only uh, when we got to about the year 2010 that the sun started really to pick up activity again. So in itself, usually you think, well, the most interesting thing is when the sun is active, but it was really quite fascinating and um, quite a treat to see the sun in its uh, most quiescent state for these several years as well. But the stereo uh, missions continue to produce uh, key information for understanding the more global uh, behavior of the sun. And this is a, a good point maybe to mention, just mention the fact that um, if you had gone back a decade or two decades, um, there would have been talk about trying to understand the sun, its influence on human affairs, on uh, human technology, um, what is uh, broadly called space weather. Uh, but uh, the, real, the last decade has seen spectacular advances in our ability to look at the sun, to use ground-based observations of the sun, to use this information from satellites in space. And in combination uh, with numerical modeling, which I'm sure you're going to hear a lot about, to really be able to put together a picture, uh, an accurate and increasingly accurate forecasting ability to go from the sun through the uh, heliosphere and ultimately to produce things that people here, for example, here in Boulder at the um, Space Weather Prediction Center of NOAA, and to be able to tell not just uh, minutes but hours and days in advance what's going to be um, uh, coming at the Earth and what might be affecting our uh, technologies in space. And uh, we've been using these models. This is called the wang shili RG model. It's an empirical model that looks at the sun, uses uh, ground-based observations uh, in particular, feeds into a large numerical model called Enlil, the uh, uh, god of the winds, the uh, Middle Eastern god of the winds, and, uh, and then ultimately this uh, predicts what's going to be uh, hitting the Earth and telling what uh, space weather will be three or four days from now. And uh, this has uh, really proven to be immensely useful, not only from a space weather standpoint, but also scientifically. This is from uh, some work we published in JGR a few years back. But it really uh, uses, the, we're now what you're looking at here on the left is uh, looking down on the pole of the sun. The sun's right in the center here. This is the extent of the wang shili uh, model extension. And then that hands off to Enlil, and Enlil models the 
flow. The solar wind speed is what's being color coded here. Broad region of, uh, of high speed, relatively high speed outward flow of the sun, uh, solar wind. And then lower flow, and then seeing the 27 day rotation of the sun uh, right here. And uh, stereo ahead and behind, ACE at this location. And so we can calibrate the whole system. The blue curves here are the numerical model values. The red points are the data. And you, I think you can just by visual inspection see that these numerical models were doing a pretty good job of capturing the high speed streams, the variation of the solar wind at these several locations. And just as an aside, I'll say that we were then using this uh, broad modeling information to also tell us what to expect with um, Mercury Messenger in orbit around the spacecraft or flying by the, space, uh, by the uh, inner planet of the solar system, Mercury, at this particular time. Now, the most recent addition to the stable of spacecraft that are looking at the sun uh, is a, a tremendous uh, asset. This is called the Solar Dynamics Observatory. It's the first of NASA's Living with a Star spacecraft. It was launched uh, only in uh, 2010. Um, my personal belief is that the launch of SDO was what, was what triggered the resurgence of solar activity because now the sun felt we were worthy of seeing its, uh, its details. And uh, I'm just kidding, I'm, I'm not as, uh, as uh, anthropomorphic as all this. But I, anyway, I do believe that uh, SDO has been a spectacular success. And it's got images to study the, the detailed um, wavelength uh, variations, the uh, variations at various wavelengths, uh, instruments from our lab, but also imaging that's just breathtaking. And um, I think, in fact, this is on the cover, of, uh, some of these kinds of images are on the cover of your uh, handout book. But being able to see the sun in exquisite detail at multiple wavelengths uh, is really spectacular. And so I thought I'd take just a little time here to um, to play a movie which I think has been, uh, is very arresting. And so uh, I hope the sound will come on here. And can you hear the music, the beginning of music? Okay. So um, SDO, uh, the this is the first year or so, remembering that this was during really pretty quiet, uh, low activity period. But this is a, a, a montage of things that are going on in the sun. And so if you went out and looked, I hope you wouldn't stare too long. If you look at the sun from uh, Earth, you see a featureless yellow orb. But if, again, if you look at the sun in these other wavelengths from space, you see the roiling, boiling surface of the sun. You see these knots of magnetic field, loops of magnetic field. You see instabilities. You can see the dark spots, the sunspots that from which powerful magnetic fields emanate. Uh, the um, microstructure the, and the uh, global scale variations occurring concurrently are just fascinating um, to, to think about and to realize that this object, um, our, our star, our most important star, is, uh, is fascinating on all of these different spatial and temporal scales. And now as it's moving toward its maximum um, in 2013 uh, and in 2014, we're going to see uh, even more of the uh, powerful emissions from the sun and uh, large blasts of material, uh, undoubtedly, as we saw uh, about a decade ago. So. Um, I think that SDO uh, is an excellent advertisement for the field, just uh, giving you in a very visual way uh, some understanding of how spectacular plasma physics, local plasma physics, local astrophysics really can be. Now, <clears throat> we uh, mentioning local astrophysics, I think we have to recognize that we are um, one solar system out of many. <clears throat> Another advertisement for LASP is that we're doing the operations over at our place for a mission called Kepler. Kepler is looking for Earth-like planets around other stars. Some 3,000 um, planet candidates have been um, detected by Kepler so far. And uh, we're beginning to realize <clears throat> more and more that there are these solar systems around uh, 
most other stars as well. But uh, these are images from Hubble uh, showing um, what a, a, the kind of magnetospheric-like regions, bow shock and uh, magnetopause, if you will, around other stars. And this schematic on the right shows our heliosphere, the termination shock through which the voyagers have now passed, uh, the presumption of a heliopause, an analogy with our own magnetospheric system, and a bow shock beyond. These are all question marks something it's very hard for us to see about our own system, but uh, these are the things that are believed to exist. Uh, a, a mission launched in 2008 called IBEX, the uh, Interstellar Boundary Explorer, I think it stands for, uh, has detected using neutral atom imaging techniques, has uh, detected a band uh, presumably emanating from that very boundary of our heliosphere uh, out at the edge of the solar system and um, has reported the first images of the edge. And we are again in a spectacular age in a sense that the Voyagers launched, uh, what, 35 years ago or more, um, happened to be out in that vicinity and making in situ measurements the same time as this mission uh, began to return these uh, spectacular images that can only be understood as, as emanating from where the magnetic fields, the interstellar magnetic fields are overlying the, um, the plasma boundaries of our uh, solar system. So I want to uh, now just uh, emphasize further that space physics um, really is done in the context of uh, a much broader sweep of observations. There are the solar observations that I've told you about, told you something about, but there also <clears throat> are observations of the various planets and to the great credit of solar system exploration they've usually carried sensors from our disciplinary area that really allow us to make measurements uh, uh, Laddie's going to launch in 2013 I'll talk to you more in a second about MAVEN that's going to Mars as a planetary mission <clears throat> the uh, exploration of Jupiter with Galileo I could also put Juno on here which is on its way to Jupiter the Voyagers passed by Saturn, and then we've had Cassini operating, and hopefully we'll continue until at least 2017. The Voyager explorations of the outer gas planets and then at, at Pluto. And so this makes a key point that the solar exploration folks, the planetary folks, if you will, have worked closely with heliophysics to uh, permit this broad, comparative planetary study. And we've learned so much. If you study one system, you know a lot about that one system. But if you can compare and contrast multiple systems under different conditions, you learn so much more. And uh, so um, uh, one of the discovery uh, missions uh, called MESSENGER, I won't even try to remember what the acronym stands for. It's a very contorted uh, acronym. Um, but uh, this spacecraft flew by uh, Mercury, as I mentioned a bit earlier, three times. It flew by, um, it was launched, flew by Earth once for a gravitational assist, it flew by Venus twice for gravitational assist, it flew by Mercury three times to sync up, and so uh, going from 2004 to 2011, seven years before we could finally get into orbit. But we got successfully into orbit um, on um, March 18th of 2011, and uh, Here's one of the flybys. I'll just talk over this um, as this is, uh, this is the path that uh, the first messenger flyby took. And um, what's portrayed here is our expectation of a small Earth-like magnetosphere, which uh, is pretty much confirmed. But Mercury fills a huge volume of the magnetosphere compared to the Earth being a little dot in the center of our magnetosphere, or Jupiter similar being pretty small in the system. Mercury, the body of the planet, fills a huge volume. But as we flew by, we were able to confirm the intrinsic magnetic field, the existence of these uh, different plasma regimes, these different boundaries. So there are many analogies between what we uh, see and are seeing at Mercury. And um, uh, the uh, working closely uh, with Jim Slavin and a, a team of space physicists, uh, Jim is now at the University of Michigan as well, Tom Zubukin and, and uh, others, um, we've been able to learn a great deal from the flybys, and now uh, we've been acquiring uh, data since um, March of 2011 in orbit around Mercury. And this has really led to 
uh, a picture of a, uh, a small but immensely uh, active and powerful uh, magnetosphere. Um, bursts of energetic particles, we've been studying those, uh, the uh, huge variations in magnetic fields, seeing rec reconnection rates that are easily a factor of 10 more powerful pound for pound at Mercury than they are at Earth. And so uh, this little place that many thought was going to be dull and boring, uh, like visiting the moon again, just closer to the sun, has turned out to be anything but that, and it's, uh, it's just a, a fascinating ongoing uh, study. And we've, we're in our extended mission phase, and we hope to be in an extended, extended mission phase until approximately uh, 2014, or possibly as late as 2015, when inexorably, um, messenger, because of uh, solar gravity uh, forcing, will uh, crash into the surface of Mercury. On the other end of the spectrum, I talked to you about Jupiter before, but um, Cassini has been operating uh, for some time in orbit around the planet Saturn. There's a huge moon there, the only moon with a, uh, its own atmosphere, Titan. And uh, this has been um, studied, and the, again, using the technique that I talked to you about for IBEX, this energetic neutral atom imaging, Don Mitchell and colleagues at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab have been able to study the interactions of the ring uh, system with the planetary or the moon system. And uh, Wayne Pryor et al. also studied the sort of electrodynamics of connection between the Saturn aurora and the moon Enceladus. So again and again we see this theme of uh, in the interconnectedness of the different bodies and these connections are invariably through magnetic fields and plasma effects. Another mission uh, that uh, we're very excited about, my uh, close colleague at last, Bruce Joukowsky, is the principal investigator for a scout mission going to Mars called MAVEN. You see the acronym there. And this, this mission, uh, although it's being carried out under the aegis of the planetary program, really has as a focus understanding how is the solar wind interaction with the atmosphere of Mars, how does that lead to the loss of water, and uh, what, what does that tell us about the history of the evolution of um, Mars's atmosphere. There's a widespread belief, although debated, but a widespread belief that Mars um, early in its history was much more Earth-like, uh, the warm, wet phase of uh, Mars, and that over time, because of the erosion of the atmosphere, the lack of a strong intrinsic field to help protect the atmosphere, that Mars changed due to the interaction with the solar wind. And so the uh, MAVEN mission will launch in November of 2013 and will operate in situ with a, a wide range of uh, space plasma kind of instruments. And uh, so this, uh, I'm sort of, I hope I'm not boring you too much here, but I'm getting sort of toward the, um, the end of what I wanted to say. But I, wanted, I want to tell you uh, that starting out from these very first simple understandings of Van Allen and colleagues of the existence of a, uh, a region of radiation or regions of radiation around the Earth, uh, the more modern day view um, a um, idealized picture of the Earth magnetosphere system now, which I'm sure you'll learn much more about uh, during the course of this summer school, uh, is much more complex, much more subtle than we might have expected. And this, this diagram tells us a lot about the 3D magnetosphere, the solar wind interaction, strong shock wave in front of this, the supersonic, superalphanic solar wind flow uh, leads to a sheath region and then the confining uh, magnetopause boundary. But inside of this, there are huge um, scale current systems. There are the trapped particles commingled with cold plasmas of various origins. And so this is a much, much more complex picture than we might first have guessed. And uh, it is the prototype on which we base our understanding and our studies of other planetary systems as well. But when you think about all the, all the systems that we rely on so much in our daily lives, uh, space systems, and uh, many of our Earth-based technologies being embedded within this complex um, plasma regime, uh, really mean that we are increasingly susceptible to the variations of the sun and uh, the ultimate variations of the geospace, the Earth space variations. 
So these coronal mass ejections and the subsequent powerful aurora and the currents that are flowing in the ionosphere really do affect uh, satellites, space stations, and so forth. Uh, they have clear effects, which uh, could have been another, I don't know if you're going to have a, sp a lecture on space weather per se in this school or not, but um, that'll be, uh, please be alert to all the kind of consequential effects, possibly even climate effects that are associated with these Sun-Earth relationships. And so this is a, a, a remarkable thing. And again, as I tried to say before, we've come so far just in the last decade in understanding these things and understanding more deeply how, um, how solar variations and solar storms and uh, geomagnetic storms really do affect uh, our daily lives. So going from the uh, early days with just a, a smattering of missions uh, spread all over the place, we now have um, what I would consider to be a spectacular uh, combination of these different missions which operated together or used together uh, constitute what is the evolving heliophysics system observatory. We have um, many of the missions I've talked to you about here, ACE monitoring the solar wind, the Voyagers that are way out there, uh, but the stereos ahead and behind, SOHO, and then uh, a boatload of missions that continue to operate and return valuable data about many aspects of the magnetosphere, ionosphere, atmosphere system. And in the near future, uh, we hope we will successfully launch uh, new missions this year or late this year, early next year, IRIS, another solar mission. And, uh, and no earlier than, and we hope not much later than the 23rd of August of uh, 2012 here, we'll launch the dual radiation belt storm probes missions, RBSP. So I think it's very fitting that uh, here we are on uh, 50 plus years, five decades on. We're uh, finally going to go back with the with suitably instrumented um, instruments uh, on two spacecraft, uh, uh, identically instrumented spacecraft, RBSP, that are going to really properly study the physics and the whole context of the Van Allen belts. And uh, I believe that we're just about, you know, we're in a landing pattern to name this mission simply the Van Allen mission. Uh, and uh, I think it's so fitting uh, that Professor Van Allen be commemorated in this way. And so um, these missions are going to study this outer belt region, which is the most efficient and effective um, accelerator uh, we uh, know of as far as accelerating quickly and to very high energies, uh, particles uh, of uh, great practical significance. Going to study uh, more about the slot region, understand better its formation, understand the inner belts. So I thought I'd just show you an animation that my good friend uh, Ian Mann and his colleagues um, at the University of Alberta put together. And this is part of the International Living with a Star program. I see Lika's here, so um, I'm glad I put that on the slide. Uh, but uh, imagine that um, we're launching, and here you see in the blue orbits the two RBSP spacecraft that will be launched. There's also plans for the Japanese to launch uh, a radiation belt mission called ERG, and we might still have some hope that the Canadians will uh, get on board later and launch um, some radiation sensing instruments as well. But this animation gives you some sense of the volume that we're talking about. And in a second here, these are the GOES East and West spacecraft portrayed. But here's a, a um, field line threading a spacecraft location. Here are the inner and outer Van Allen belts, the uh, confinement by the solar wind. Here's a very large electron uh, drifting around in the uh, magnetic field. And as the solar wind varies, as the uh, nature of the interaction changes, you see the buffeting of the magnetosphere by the flowing solar winds. The heating up, the brightening here of the uh, regions indicating uh, great heating and intensification of the radiation belt populations the loss of uh, particles down into the Earth's atmosphere, coupling this uh, behavior from high altitudes down into the very depths of the uh, Earth's uh, atmosphere. And so uh, this is a system well worth studying and much more to be learned. When we go beyond that, what, mu what else must we really study? Well, we need to learn much more about how complex systems, which is what we're talking about here, catastrophically reconfigure themselves. How do local um, 
turbulence and so forth really relate to global scale um, instability and so understanding the multi-scale nature of plasmas. A magnetospheric multi-scale mission in development now, four spacecraft that are going to fly in close constellation and uh, will be launched in 2014 and we'll be able then to see how the progression of geomagnetic disturbances from the micro scale and put that in the context of the macro scale. And so reconnection underpins much of what we see, much of the uh, variation we see on the sun, much of what we see going on in the earth system is really related to this uh, process that's going on at the uh, very smallest physical scales and uh, it's a, an extraordinary fact of, um, of uh, astrophysics that we have to understand these, uh, we have to understand things on all scales in order to be able to understand things on any scale. As I mentioned to you, this is from uh, our friend Dave Hathaway at Marshall Space Flight Center, but uh, we um, talked about things back in the 90s and the last solar maximum and the Halloween storms and all that stuff, and then we talked about going into this deep, extended profound solar minimum for several years. Now the sun has been making uh, something of a comeback. We're headed toward this um, activity uh, peak, which may be a relatively small one, but nonetheless we can't rule out the possibility, in fact the probability, of many large coronal mass ejection events uh, in the next two or three years. So hang on to something. I hope you'll uh, join in the, the fray here and study a lot of these things. I just want to point out to you that, um, as I say, a bittersweet kind of aspect of this is that um, I really felt uh, a wonderful beginning in my life with the launch of SAMPEX back in 1992. <clears throat> and um, there were many who believed that SAMPEX would probably not make it through because of atmospheric drag, would not make it through this sunspot maximum in about 2000, 2001. But it made it through fine and it's continued to operate. and. Uh, if Lika plugs her ears, I'll just say uh, the lack of wisdom of NASA to continue to fund uh, SAMPEX. Nonetheless, uh, other ways, we were able to continue to collect data from SAMPEX and have continued to this day. But now, the increasingly active sun um, means that atmospheric drag is picking up, and SAMPEX is, uh, is suffering tremendously from atmospheric drag and most likely will re-enter the Earth's atmosphere in September of 2012 probably no earlier than August and uh, no later than December. So it's ironic in a way that just as we get the radiation belt storm probes up, SAMPEX, which has been one of our best monitors of the radiation belts, will end its life. So I guess it's sort of a handoff of some sort, uh, but um, we're very pleased that it's had such a long run. So let me summarize by saying that um, I hope I've been able in a little way to help convince you that this is a fascinating discipline, rich in history. The sun, the earth, the various planets, the interplanetary medium out to the very fringes of the solar system form this coupled system, highly coupled in many ways. Um, the missions and programs touched on here, and I've only been able to touch on a small subset of them, it's, as I said at the beginning, a very personal kind of history. but. Um, I've barely scratched the surface of what we learned scientifically. I do have the satisfaction of knowing that many of these things will be dealt with in much greater, more complete detail by other speakers. And uh, I just would like to assert to you that heliophysics uniquely combines the basic science uh, that uh, uh, has so illuminated all of astrophysics, and it has as well these crucially important applied aspects that we call space weather. So if there's a homework assignment from this lecture, I think it would be uh, please use this period of time that you'll have, um, use it well, and uh, identify things that really interest you, and um, start to dig into those more deeply as you go in through your graduate careers. You have a chance to take advantage of all the data that have been acquired, and you also have a chance to join in these new missions that are operating now or that are going to be operating in the near future. So um, I hope you will use your time here to good effect, find out what most uh, fascinates you and study that facet very well. Thank you very much. So I, I believe uh, questions are permitted and may be encouraged. Uh, and uh, if you don't raise your hand, I may call on you and give you a quiz here. So.
This is the time for volunteers, okay? Anybody have any questions? Yes. Okay, well, well I'll start there and then go to you, okay? Okay, yes. Yeah, the question was on Explorer 1, how do they decide on the instruments to include? Um, that's a very good question, and um, the inclusion of instrumentation was um, a complex matter, but uh, what they really uh, had looked around for was what group had instruments that would, would fit, uh, you know, had the right mass and size to fit on a, on a small spacecraft and could be ready quickly enough. Um, and this was a time of the Cold War. There was uh, intense uh, time competition. Sputnik had been launched. And so Van Allen and team were selected because they'd been working with uh, JPL, had been working with Von Braun and all in other capacities. The uh, small, compact Geiger tube instrument that Van Allen had was ideally suited for flight. And so it was it was sort of an accident in a way. They wanted to know what, what were the cosmic rays uh, like as you went up to higher altitude, sort of for a practical reason. And um, so it seemed important to have energetic particle measurements. And then who had um, a small enough instrument that could really fit on the spacecraft? Um, if I can just take a little second longer to describe that, they had no, they had, there had been some theoretical suggestions, but they had no real idea that there were these trapped particles. And so as the uh, Explorer um, payload started to operate, it was counting higher and higher and higher, and then it dropped to zero counts. And uh, Van Allen's and his students' first interpretation was that somehow there was a failure of the instrumentation. Then uh, they uh, wondered, well, could the radiation, like cosmic radiation coming from afar, could that really drop to zero? No, not probably. So they went back to the lab. Carl McElwain, one of the guys I mentioned, took the instruments into the lab, subjected them to very high intensity radiation, and found that the electronics saturated, and so it dropped to, to zero. So that was what allowed them to infer that this must be much more intense radiation. Ernie Ray is quoted as saying, my god, space is radioactive. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, then uh, they put on instruments that were capable of dealing with much higher intensity radiation and subsequently. But, but it's a very fascinating history of how you went from a group studying cosmic rays to uh, detecting the Van Allen belts. Read the book. Yes? Mm. Yeah, good question. So the question's about uh, Voyager, and that Voyager has been operating this long time now and is out at the fringe of the solar system. Um, there are two things that limit um, the uh, or the receiving of data from the outer uh, part of the solar system. And if, uh, let me take a detour and I'll come back to the specifics of your question. But uh, when Pioneer was launched, the deep space network that was going to track it was capable of detecting the 8 watt transmitter only out to about the orbit of Jupiter. So the view was that um, the ground based tracking, you know, looking at a um, the equivalent of a refrigerator light, and you know the energy out that distance is pretty impressive anyway. But as uh, Pioneer was flying out, uh, the ground-based capabilities got greater and greater, and so um, the reception always stayed ahead of the uh, transmitter power. Um, but um, the uh, and the same has been true in subsequent times. So it's extraordinary what uh, the deep space net can do as far as uh, tracking. So that tends not to be the problem, although data rates have gotten lower and lower, the, the capability of finding the signal has become uh, remained a challenge. The biggest problem has been the power. <clears throat> That's the radioactive isotope thermoelectric generators. And um, the efficiency of those has dropped with time. And so it's probably the early 2020s when Voyager will um, s cease to have to produce enough intrinsic power on board to operate the transmitter, to operate the instruments. And so um, we're at a, a key point here. If we want to really um, have more observations from near Earth of this outer fringe and have in situ measurements from Voyager, that all has to be carried out in roughly the next 10 years. Okay. Other questions? Yes, a fine student here I see in the back, yes. <laughs> Yeah. 
Right. Yeah, the, the question is a very good one, which, uh, and of course, uh, artists are influenced by what they know, and so uh, pr producing an artistic image um, is uh, often heavily influenced by, by uh, the things you're familiar with. So the, the question about what's different about Mercury is, uh, is a good one. The first and uh, one of the most fundamental things is here we have an unusual system in which there's a very thin atmosphere. It's, it's a, uh, a surface-bound exosphere, so there's virtually no ionosphere. There's a strong magnetic field. So the, one of the first striking things is, of course, that <clears throat> Mercury's body fills such a huge volume of the magnetospheric system, so that phase space is all taken up. And so um, you have very little maneuvering room if you're a particle trying to drift around in that system. Secondly, then, is the absence, near, uh, nearly complete absence of an ionosphere and uh, a dense atmosphere around Mercury. So the fact that we see so many Earth-like plasma processes like reconnection, like um, substorm-like events, and yet we don't have w what we think plays such a key role in Earth, which is the ionosphere, a place for current closure and all that. Um, and uh, in fact, um, again, instruments on board Messenger have revealed um, an incredibly rich exotic kind of population of ions and, and uh, neutral uh, sodium, calcium, all these species that play virtually no role in the Earth system. So in a, in a artist, simple artist concept, there it's, it's sort of hard to portray all the differences. The basic magnetic interactions are quite similar. Uh, of course, the, uh, the mercury of uh, the planetary um, body is vastly different. And the fact that we're one over R squared, you know, uh, we're uh, seeing a factor of 10 higher solar wind densities. Uh, we're seeing um, a very powerful magnetic fields that just are not present at the Earth orbit. All lead to a whole host of subtle differences or not so subtle differences as well. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, another fine student in the back. Lika. Yes. Absolutely, yeah. So <clears throat> Lika's uh, point, of course, is that uh, Solar Probe Plus launched in 2018. Um, takes some time to, um, to make the first passages through the near regions of the sun. Um, indeed, that's going to be um, crucially important. And I, I would just uh, emphasize the point I tried to make and that you make very well, which is um, we have all of these wonderful historical things but with new understanding, we can ask much better questions. We can um, dig much more deeply. And so I would again emphasize that things are coming along on the right time scales for you. Um, RBSP, not too bad. Uh, the, uh, the magnetospheric multiscale, just about right for many of you to uh, do uh, PhD theses on uh, issues related to magnetic connection. Um, something else I guess I would just emphasize is uh, I hope that you, you will all at least think about adopting this more global view, not just to focus on one little narrow topic, which you'll have to do, you'll have to specialize in something, but really do think about this system. It's, it is a system and think more globally 
and think about the applicability of what you learn in one place and how it applies in another place. It's very important uh, to do. And um, also, uh, Lika's question reminds us that uh, until we, we're, we're uh, all essentially plasma physicists, and until we understand the plasma physics at the local level and then how that starts to um, cooperatively transcend these different scales, um, and gets to this very uh, large, the global scale. Um, it's it's a uh, it's an almost a seamless transition from one to uh, one scale to the next and on up to the to the global scale. So uh, study that carefully. So this is going to be one of your last calls here for questions. I'd like to see more students uh, asking um, anything and everything. Something that would really completely stump the speaker would be nice. Yes, okay, I've got a... Ah, oh, yes. Okay, the question... Yes, yes. Uh, so the question is about the AIM mission, the Aeronomy of Ice in the Mesosphere, and uh, this is another uh, mission that's sort of transitional between space physics uh, and, uh, and atmospheric science, and, uh, and so uh, what AIM, um, as I say, set out to do was to was motivated by the fact that um, not to loosen clouds, these eerie clouds that are seen in the northern, you know, far northern regions, were first um, were first reported in about 1850 or so, you know, in the uh, Industrial Revolution times, um, and hadn't been noted before. And uh, they are <clears throat> they appear in the summer, and they appear at these at high northerly latitudes, perhaps probably southerly too, but there aren't many people living in the uh, comparable regions in the south. And it appeared uh, as well that these were increasing in frequency uh, with time. And so there were the first sporadic observations in the 1850s, and then we started to see more and more of them. And as, as climate change has progressed, the, Im the impression was that noctilucent clouds were appearing more and more. And so the, the theory had been that um, that these clouds are appearing because water vapor was uh, was actually that they were water and that they were um, forming at the coldest place in the uh, Earth's atmosphere, which is right at the mesopause. And so um, the goal of the mission was to observe not from one point on the Earth where you have other clouds that interfere and stuff, but get above and to really be able to see these polar mesospheric clouds from above and to ob observe them systematically, understand whether they're increasing frequency. Uh, increasing in uh, extent, and uh, and indeed uh, the the mission was launched and uh, and began to make uh, global images and and make in situ observations as well to understand this. And I think it has fulfilled very well the goal of of being able to study much more systematically the noctilucent clouds to understand the spatial extent, understand the earlier and earlier formation um, as the atmosphere changed. And so many have uh, likened this to the canary and the miner's canary in the mine shaft, you know, that it's, it's a, one of the most sensitive indicators. And people here at HAO, Ray Robel and others, had suggested that these changes, these increasingly cold temperatures earlier and later in the season, summer season, would be a very sensitive indicator of the changes of the entire atmosphere, uh, hence the climate change connection. Uh, there's another interesting aspect of AIM, which was that about five days after launch, its transceiver started to fail, and uh, and so it uh, started to lose uh, ability to be communicated with. And um, I wrote a little paper about this that actually was a place where bad space weather was good. As when space weather became more disturbed, the receiver worked better. So I, if you're interested, I can send you the paper. But but anyway, um, we, it's reached a point now where we hardly ever get contact. The operations team has developed a new technique, which is to use just higher and lower power, sort of like a Morse code from using the TDRA satellites to communicate. And so sort of like you, you're, instead of sending a television signal, you're using a drum or something to send messages. But they are able to um, use this very uh, remarkable Morse code to just uh, send commands uh, at the, uh, say, state one, state two, state three of the of the um, electronics on the spacecraft. So, um, I urge you to go and, and look at some of the literature on AIM. It's quite fascinating. So, other questions? Looks like I've exhausted them, Dana. So, okay. Thank. You. Okay. Thanks very much.